Hi, everyone. Welcome to Type Talks. Today, we have Roger Pierman with us, and he is the author of the book, You, and many other things as well. It's a real big pleasure to have you on as one of the veterans of the type community, and I highly respect all the work that you put out. And so, Roger, could you let us know a little bit about yourself for people who are new to you? Well, thank you so much, Joyce, for the opportunity to be a part of your um, type talk conversations that are going on. And I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about my journey and maybe some new things that folks might might find uh, useful. Uh, you, you, Many of you might have experienced taking the MBTI when you were in college. Uh, what happened to me was in my freshman year, I took the MBTI, then it was called Research Form F. And I actually still have the answer sheet and the scoring card that, that came because um, in the interpretation of that at that particular moment, as I was trying to figure out as a college freshman what in the world I was going to do, um, I received the interpretation of my four-letter code, INFP. And for the very first time in my young life, Everything I read about the way my head works, not only did it resonate with me and did it affirm um, my sense of, of how I approach life, um, it was, it was a, one of those thrilling moments that, wow, there's a way to understand how things work in my head. And uh, there's this remarkable system that helps us understand others. And it sent me on a journey that's now been a lifelong journey. I immediately wanted to understand who this guy by the name of Carl Jung was. Um, that, because the way it was presented to me was that Carl Jung had this theory that Catherine Briggs and Isabel Myers had uh, utilized in creating their tool. And um, I, immediately started my own private <laughs> curriculum on understanding Jungian thought and understanding the way in which type um, was presented by him and that caught the imagination of these two remarkable people. And I learned how remarkable they were as the years, as the years went by. Well, when I got into graduate school, uh, I was in uh, counseling psychology and Sure enough, um, one of the faculty members had arranged for Mary McCauley to come to campus to do what was then called an MBTI workshop. And it was the predecessor to certification or qualification programs. And I met Mary and we instantaneously became friends. Um, and from that day forward, as I attended uh, Association for Psychological Type meetings, whether it was a regional meeting or the, at that time, national meeting, uh, Mary and I always had a standing breakfast date to talk about type and to talk about things we were researching. And it was in those early days that Mary made a request of me that I have tried to honor throughout my professional life. And what Mary said to me was, um, we desperately need whole type research. We do not need any more correlations between E and I and social behavior or S and N um, and how people uh, deal with data kinds of factors or T and F and how that shows up in being agreeable or not, etc. What we really need is for folks to seriously take the proposition that the dynamic that's going on, let's say with an ISTJ is qualitatively different than the dynamic and the reality of an ISTP or any uh, of the types, but just that one as, as a, an immediate contrast. And I said to Mary, I will do my best in all the work and research I do to pursue an understanding of the whole, not the part. And it was that commitment that 
as I did my work and collected data over time, began to take a look not at just ENI, SNN, or TNF, but also how in the world does the dynamic show up and how does it play out? Um, and it is that uh, reality that has been a source of enormous curiosity and interest for me throughout my professional life. Um, after I completed my graduate work, uh, I, I became the first director of the learning program, learning center for Wake Forest University. And in that role, I used type um, in getting data uh, and facilitating uh, helping students understand their style and patterns and the kinds of things that they might find most useful in approaching their work given their type. And I did that for uh, seven years before I left academic life and went into the corporate world where I was the uh, chief talent officer and HR officer for a financial services company. And we did training programs, not only for our customers, but also big programs internally for all of our, our staff. And in those activities, we use type and we use type as a part of a way of self-awareness and self-discovery. Concurrent with that was my seeking out the, the knowledge and know-how of the Center for Creative Leadership, which is the largest standalone not-for-profit center for training and leadership development on the planet. And as I was utilizing them for training inside the company where I was the, the uh, chief talent officer, um, I struck up a relationship with them. And because they use type, uh, I proposed one day that we do a research project looking at their global data collection of the MBTI and all of their other tools. And so they had thousands of um, individuals who had completed the MBTI, had gone through a training program and coaching process. And we had, I think at the time, 11 different other instruments and a set of problem solving observations by a panel of observers who rated individuals on uh, 30 factors. So I was now able to take all of that data and simply start looking at, wow, how does it show up that an ISTJ is very different than an ISTP or an ESTP, qualitatively different from uh, an ESTJ and any of the other type patterns that we um, we would have interest in. And it was this passion, this exploration around whole type that led to the first book, I'm Not Crazy, I'm Just Not You, which is now in its third edition. Um, I've always found it fascinating to me that of, of all the type books, that one has been translated into multiple languages, uh, both um, uh, Japanese and Arabic, and continues to be a fascination in those two populations. And my understanding is it has been translated not necessarily legally um, in a couple of other languages as, as well. And also this research drove the introduction to type and emotional intelligence, and it drove you uh, being more effective in your MBTI type, um, as well as any number of articles, which you mentioned, uh, Joyce, that, that I have put out there in the world. Now, as you might imagine, the research produced a 800 page statistical report. I mean, we, we, we're looking at 16 types across 11 variable, 11 assessments. Some of the assessments had as many as 27 scales. Some, some of them as many as 100 behavioral statements where there were multi-rater reviews so that you could look to see what did the bosses say, what did the peers say, etc. And Obviously, 
you can't just publish the charts because that won't mean anything to people. So how do you interpret that information and how do you get that information out there in the world? And, and uh, I've tried to do that in a number of ways. There was a period of time I had some iPad applications that my business partner and I had created um, one called Teamosity, another one Relationshiposity, and and um, those were designed to help people take a look at the interaction of their types and get some action tips, which is to make it more immediate um, in the use of, of type. I still have a major book that I I need to write, and it's been very much on my mind as I um, have reached this point in this age in my life. Um, that that really has to do with what I consider to be some of the most critical findings in that work. Yes, it's it's great to be able to look at the t action tips and you and get a handle on what that typically means for the typical ISTJ or ENTJ or INFP, etc. And let me quickly say um, that the data show without doubt that all types can be equally effective leaders. Uh, yes, there's a difference in the frequency of ISFPs who seek out leadership roles. Shh, there are very few who do, but those who do are as effective as, as ENTJs who seem to be inclined to pursue leadership level responsibilities. So I, I, I just want to make, make it clear to everybody, um, yes, we have uh, the attraction to that kind of work does vary tremendously by type and those who are attracted to it can be incredibly effective no matter what their type is, as well as their challenges and issues can be reasonably predicted um, given their type. So for example, in my coaching with folks, it is, Quite often the case that sensing types, all of the sensing types, all eight of them, uh, tend to need uh, encouragement and guidance on um, moving into a strategic orientation when dealing with larger leadership related challenges. Likewise, all of the intuitive types tend to need um, a better handle on the details of project management and all of the who, what, where, and whens. I mean, that, that's just as a statement of trends, uh, it, 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 if I look at the big picture. But here's the story that I need to tell, and I hope I get a chance to do it um, while I still have a brain that, <laughs> that works. Um, in that data, it became very interesting that <clears throat> there were differences in the development of each of the types. So for example, one of the factors in, in the data I had had to do with what the psychologists referred to as ego integration. And it, it's really about how efficiently and effectively an individual manages his or her resources, psychologically speaking, and how do they demonstrate that and and what kind of well-being do they have as a result of being what we would call well integrated individuals uh, on the high end on the low end not so well integrated and and typologically what's interesting how that shows up is um, let's let's again take an istj who's at the high end of ego integration istjs there tend to be um, and are observed and reported as being exceptionally attuned to how to leverage uh, information around them and how to ask questions to help uh, expose trends and patterns that wouldn't necessarily come natural to the way they think about things. On the low end, the ISTJ is a caricature of a rigid, hard, difficult, it's got to be everything black or white um, in the treatment of information. And so if you look at it on a continuum, the development of the type uh, as, we, as we look at that data tells us that there's a sort of three big buckets. 
there are those that aren't developed so well and they have very particular challenges which are reflective of their typology those who are what we will call typical and then those who are uh, well developed in their type and how they navigate and flex to the demands um, that they experience and the journey of each of the types is is really different in this journey and exploration of mine as well i have i decided that you know myers gave us a way to think about uh, type dynamics but not so much a way to understand how our natural style might play out in a world that may demand something else of us. So I created the Pyramid Personality Integrator to look at the eight functions, extroverted sensing, introverted sensing, extroverted intuiting, introverted intuiting, extroverted thinking, introverted thinking, et cetera. I, I created that tool to sort of look at some really important questions. One is, what am I most naturally inclined to and, and utilize just because it, it comes naturally to me? What is it that the environment demands of me? So let's take, a, let's take an, um, an ENFJ, for example, a manager who is seen as masterful in relationship building and collaboration, who happens to be in a situation where a new president comes into the organization and this executive now is dealing with an ESTJ executive who has rigid demands on various kinds of data sets and various kinds of approaches. And so all of a sudden, this ENFJ is now having to accommodate and respond in, in, in a different way. Well, that pressure could create a good deal of stress and could create a lot of, of uh, needs for some coping strategies to deal with what is rubbing against what is, doesn't mean the person can't do it, just means that it, it, they are aware of this psychological pressure that they are experiencing. So the question then becomes, how do we flex? How do we, let's say we're ENFJ and we're now in an environment that's demanding something of us, which is quite different. Um, and so we have to flex. And so I was interested in helping individuals get a handle on what are the functions that are most natural to you that you just, you know, your shoes off self you rely on. And then what are those things being demanded of you from the setting that you're in and how are you flexing within those so that, you can get a better handle on what it is that that contributes to your ability to flex. And so uh, an ENFJ needing to flex and pull more on an ST-ishness um, is a very, very different set of challenges than, let's say, an ESTJ who's now having to pull on an F-ishness in order to foster the relationships that they they might have. So um, that commitment that I made to Mary <laughs> has played out over my life and has led me into great curiosities about type and, and, and it has generated for me enormous questions uh, about how can we help um, individuals understand themselves better and make healthier life choices as they do the things that, that, they, that they do, either in their work or in their um, uh, personal lives. So I, I know I've been talking a lot, Joyce, but you invited me to share what are some things that I, I see coming along out of my work, and I've just shared with you my plan um, to work on a piece that really gets at um, the mechanisms of type development and effectiveness that, that I think are um, important uh, to us as we have under, as we have understood type and how, how we can make type more um, useful in a very dynamic and uh, 
topsy-turvy age. Um, I, um, I think type is, is a tremendous gift. It certainly has been a gift that's enabled me to maintain my own sense of sanity um, and understanding the differences around me and being able to move from confusion to hypothesis. Oh, this person's behaving this way. Maybe that's a function of extroverted thinking for them. And if it is, let's test that out and see if there's some ways we can we can find consensus together and work in collaborative, constructive ways. Um, type has is a gift that's provided uh, that. Um, one, one of the things that people say to me is, is they'll say, you know, um, sometimes the things you write about type are not always equally um, the same sort of focus for, let's say, ISTPs that maybe you I gave to ESTPs. And my answer to that is, well, <laughs> I'm not making data up. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you something about ISTPs that isn't true simply to make it more equal to what I've written about ESTPs. I've got all these data points and the data points is what I rely on as being the truth about how people say they are and how people have seen them and how they are. So I, um, um, I know that I've worked really hard to be even in the treatment of each of the types, but I've also worked hard to make sure that the data speaks. Now, <clears throat> two, two, two other sort of thoughts that might be useful to your listeners, uh, Joyce. Myers, <clears throat> and some people know this, um, Myers spent really the last part of her life, I'd say the, the last uh, probably 15 years of her life, interested in the question of development. In fact, in Form F of the MBTI, um, over a third of the questions were questions she put in there for development exploration. Some people know that she, because the research form was included in the SAT and GRE and LSAT and MCAT tests here in the United States for many, many years. She had all this data of, of people thinking about going to graduate school and had all their type responses and she would follow people and collect data. She'd, re she'd reach out and ask tell me about things, tell me about how life's going for you, et cetera. And so she, over time, collected pretty significant data points on each of the 16 types in terms of their well-being, choices they had made in their careers, and things of that nature, which was to feed um, her creation of a type development uh, indicator, which we now today call that uh, type three. If we have step two and step three, and step three is, is really the report, the genesis of that report was the work um, that she did. Um, I happen to think that question is incredibly important, how the types are developing and growing and how we can nurture them. Um, and, and... <laughs> that we pay attention to all of the new insights we now have that did not exist when Myers and others were beginning to do their work. So for example, we now know some things neurologically we didn't know in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And when we start looking at typological stuff and brain function, we we find there's some interesting things going on there that's worth paying attention to. Um, our, we, we, we know that the brain is always a global functioning device as long as we're healthy. Um, and it has its own programs driven for our survival. 
and it has biases for certain kinds of information or certain kinds of, if you will, language. Uh, there was a piece published uh, a year or so ago where um, folks were interested, what are words that stick? And they found that there were words that were considered practical that stuck for some people, but not others. Words that were considered imaginative stuck for some people, but not others. Those of us in the type world would laugh and say, well, we're talking about the difference between sensing and intuiting in terms of the, the attraction towards certain kinds of language. Um, so we, we have um, in, in the work, I've gone back to look at the data I had mentioned that I had collected um, to think about it from a vertical development perspective. So when Robert Kagan, who's now retired from Harvard, um, started talking about the five stages of meaning making that adults get into, and you start looking at type patterns, you, you see that, oh, there is um, some relationship between the way in which an individual is making meaning of their experience as, as framed by Kagan and typological expressions and how those typological differences show up. So um, my, I guess I'm perplexed <laughs> in some ways to try to think about how to tell the development story in a fresh way that connects to all of the insights that we have today that we, we didn't have when I started on this journey. Um, and I think it would be foolish to try to talk about type development absent um, an awareness and connectivity to uh, the other things that have emerged in my life that we now have access to when it comes to understanding mechanisms of development and understanding how individuals operate in the world. I have worried for two decades now <clears throat> As I've watched the research and type drop, increasingly the number of dissertations has now flatlined. Um, we need people to take type seriously as, as a way of thinking about our thinking and our way of approaching uh, challenges in life. Uh, far too often, um, the professional societies have criticized the MBTI as being, uh, you know, uh, nothing more than uh, zodiac uh, reports of made up stories about individuals. And that's tragic. And I, I understand they have vested interest. They have a lot of vested interest in pushing a certain perspective about um, individuals. And some would argue, well, I have a vested interest in type being taken seriously. And, and my vested interest is that I have seen how it transforms people's lives. I have seen the father or mother who suddenly realized that their child had a whole different set of needs from what they anticipated and that they were not providing the environment that would allow that child to, to grow based on its nature. Elizabeth Murphy uh, shared once a, an absolutely beautiful analogy. She said, you know, the sunflower raised in the shade will still be a sunflower, but not as big and tall and glorious in its size. The violet raised in the sun will still be a violet, but it will be shriveled and it will not have the richness of color and will not have the health it would have had raised in the shade. And her point was that if we understand the essential nature of the individual 
providing them with the environment that allows that person to grow is how we get the best of of them and the best of uh, their journey and and how they move through life so um in my coaching work uh, all of it has been informed by uh, what data I know about the types and the hypotheses um, that I can make about the types. And there, there's some things that coaching wise, I find that we need to always keep in mind that the person we may be working with may have an aversion to assessments in general uh, and may even have an outright attitude, negative attitude toward type. Um, they may say, well, I took the MBTI or I did the insights or I did the majors or I did. And that was just all useless to me. That doesn't mean that type isn't there. It just means their ability to see it or understand it doesn't exist. But that doesn't mean you as coach should set it aside. Because what I find typically happens is as I'm working with the person, um, their type shows up and it gives me, I can ask general questions. So tell me about how you get re-energized. What do you do to get yourself, you know, renewed as you are dealing with the challenges in any given day? And, and almost always the story they tell tells you about extroversion or introversion. And when they're talking about the irritants, I will say, so, Gee, it sounds like a person is presenting data or information to you in a way that just doesn't settle with you. What would you say makes the difference for you? What's the kind of information that you need uh, that will help you feel confident in the other person as well as that you have what you need in order to, to do things? And lo and behold, um, again, I don't know what their preference is, but what I know is that a preference exists. And as that story is made and I get a handle on what's likely and probable, um, I can then start asking more precise questions like some of the feedback you've received suggest, and we can go through that and discuss that. And, and while I know I'm typologically thinking in, in, in the back of my head about this, it leads me to then start choosing choices and options and suggestions um, that will be helpful for this person. <clears throat> Type is always present and the dynamic is always present. And by dynamic, I mean the interplay between perception and judgment, um, how a person leans into the information they like or leans into how they prioritize and make decisions um, is present and dynamic and real. And part of my challenge often is to get them to embrace that pattern, however they've described it, and then to realize it's one-sided. See, one of the things that people forgot about Jung's work is that Jung wrote psychological types because he was concerned about one-sidedness that individuals get so enamored with their approach and orientation and style and they reinforce it in so many dynamic ways that they completely forget there's more to the story. And in fact, there are multiple points of view. And part of his hope was by helping us get a handle on our one-sidedness, uh, we could then begin to realize um, that there is a fresh perspective, a fresh orientation, a fresh way uh, we can uh, come at things that give us a deeper, broader perspective. And what I find often in coaching people is that they aren't aware of their one-sidedness. And one of the things that type gives me as a coach, again, coach, he may never know the source of this, uh, that gives me a, a, a gift for them is to begin to explore 
the legitimacy of other points of view and how it's as legitimate to take a look at data and to prioritize data in different ways as the way um, that they've done it. I have an executive right now I'm working with who is almost what we might call prototypical ESTP. And uh, getting him to slow down long enough to listen and to pause long enough to be attuned to the fact that the people he's trying to lead or manage a aren't moving at his pace b don't see the world the same way he does and um, c if he's going to ultimately influence them then his need to listen more carefully and to to begin to ask about different points of view is is going to be essential for him to be successful. If he doesn't achieve this developmental task, he will not be successful in the long term um, in his role and the challenges that, that he faces. So we, you know, it's interesting. Um, being cognizant of type as a framework, as a model, provides hypotheses that, and I and I really do see it as hypotheses. Here's a hypothesis, you know. I get all the time people saying to me, well, after five minutes, I understand you, you know, type or, you know, the MBTI or, you know, blank, blah, 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 blah. What type am I? <laughs> and I will say, I don't know. What type do you claim? Because, and I'm serious about that because um, I, I, human beings are complicated. And how you are with me in an interaction doesn't mean that's how you are with most other people. Uh, people ask me all the time when about an, uh, a political figure, what type is that figure? And I'm very reluctant to say because the political theater and the way one imagines oneself in that political theater and how you create your political brand, all of which could be driven by any number of things, a portion of which is type, but a, but could be some other things that, that override what might be the more natural part of the way a person chooses to respond in the world. Um, I, as best I can tell, Joyce, there type is a part of our dispositional architecture that we arrive in the world with. I happen to think we arrive in the world primarily with a, a trigger for extroversion or introversion. I, I just I have seen it in so many children. Um, it, and it did it, in the same family, you could have a quite extroverted child and introverted child. And it's, it's not, it's, it's uh, not about what's in the family environment per se. It's what they arrived in their genetic package with. So we know their dispositions. We know that in affecting behavior at any given time uh, are learned uh, patterns. You know, you, you, uh, my preferences I shared earlier were INFP, and I've spent a lifetime uh, learning how to give presentations, how to uh, present and engage and facilitate and do all kinds of things, which most people would say that's pretty extroverted activity. And sometimes it's pretty S-ish and T-ish. And uh, do you really know your type? Well, yes, I do. <laughs> and I know that there are things that um, by learning, I've learned to access and use in order to be successful at what I'm doing. So uh, another factor that seems to me to be on us all the time um, is what, what Jung and Freud uncovered for us, which were intrapsychic elements, whether you buy into archetypes or not, the fact of the matter is the unconscious is a powerful force and it governs our behavior in ways we hardly truly realize. Um, and I think we just have to be uh, cognizant that, that, that in fact, the power of the intrapsychic world 
is one that teaches us if we'll be open to it. And then, of course, there's culture. Culture is threaded through everything in us. So wherever we were born and raised, um, threads of, of what's important in that culture have certainly provided um, color and pattern to the way we operate in the world. I, I, I will never forget once when I was first doing uh, type workshops and leadership workshops in other parts of the world. And one particular workshop was in England and <laughs> there were a group of uh, ENFPs who were huddled together, identifying their strengths and identifying their areas that they need to stretch into. And it was very quiet and very, um, you know, they were energized, but whispering to each other and the like. And um, one of the other groups, an, an ISTJ group, said to me, would you have them get quiet? They're just noisy. Now, <laughs> by comparison in the United States, a group of ENFPs working together is a party all into itself. It is a tour de force of energy to deal with. Nothing like what was going on in this group. Um, and as we talked about it as a group, we talked about how cultural differences impact um, the expressions of our type and the way our type shows up. So when I say we're complicated, I, I think we have to be really, really careful and provide hypotheses and ask questions I asked Mary McCauley one time, I said, um, Mary, what's the best advice Isabel Myers gave you? And she thought about it for a minute and she said, you know, the best advice Isabel Myers gave me is that she said she had been thinking about it a long time and she had decided we would all be better off if we spent more time on perception in the outer world, putting perception in, in the outer world and judgment on ourselves as opposed to the other way around. And I thought about it and I thought what she was really saying is we should see the world as a set of hypotheses to explore, not a bunch of judgments to impose. And that we should learn from those perceptions and think about them in terms of our own psychological makeup and how we might use that makeup to um, enrich our lives and enrich those people whom we love and care for uh, in the work that we do. I hope, Joyce, these observations are going to be helpful to your listeners. And as I said, I, you know, what a kindness you've done to let me tell a story about my journey and how appreciative I am that you've enabled me to capture, because I haven't had this chance before, to capture some of these things that have been a part of the journey and what I hope will be still opportunities to come. I think what you shared, Roger, was beautiful. I really like the point you said about how it's important to put perception on the outer world and judgment on ourselves rather than the other way around. Because Carl Jung, you know, he talks about the concept of projection mm -hmm. and how oftentimes we judge others and then we're kinder to ourselves. And this is also called the fundamental attribution error, where we tend to think that when someone else messes up, it's a part of their character. We judge who they are. Whereas when we mess up, we're more likely to judge it as circumstance. Like, oh, you know, it was raining today. That's why I did that. Whereas we can become less forgiving and less merciful with other people. This oftentimes shows up in disagreements with loved ones. For instance, someone might do something slightly different than the other person. And the assumption on your end might be, they don't care about me or they don't care about the task. Either way, you're saying that they fundamentally don't care and you're assuming that. And this is assuming a sort of malice on another person when it may not be true. Because typically, most 
actions that rub us the wrong way are done out of ignorance rather than malice or bad intent. Hmm. And so type helps us realize that we have different ways of operating. It is an acknowledgement of the diversity of the human condition. And it gives us a clear way of putting it to words. And so given this tool, we can really see the gifts differing as Isabel Briggs Myers puts it in each person. And so, yeah, it's cool how you did a lot of research around type two. And I really do think that that's important to get more of that out there. I'm starting my PhD soon and I plan on doing my dissertation on typology. And it would be cool to have other people do that as well too. And I strongly encourage that. And so Roger Pierman will be talking at the APTI conference in November. Feel free to check it out and listen to him talk about the intersection between coaching and MBTI, because he has a lot to offer from a Jungian perspective and both a whole type perspective. It's great how you mention the snapshots of people that we have right now of them. So. Sometimes typing someone on the spot, <laughs> you can guess, but you cannot say for sure because you might just be seeing one side of a very multifaceted person. And so I like the amount of space holding you do for someone's full character to show themselves. Well, thank you, Joyce. And again, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to seeing the broadcast at some point. Let me know when it's ready. Um, and I'm going to jump to get to my next meeting. Absolutely. For sure, Roger. It was really great having you on. Again, check out the APTI conference in November. He is a really cool guy giving a really impactful presentation there. I have read your book before I met you, so it's really cool to actually see you. <laughs> Thank you. And until next time, take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.